presentation, and it's about agriculture, and then we'll go from there, okay? So let's say a word of prayer. Mm. Loving Father, we thank you so much for giving us this wonderful love message. Uh, just like a good parent, you foresaw the conditions of the world beforehand, and you gave your warnings more than a hundred years ago that your people are supposed to locate to the, to the country, raise their own provisions, commune with you and with nature, and come close to you. This message is not a denial message, but a love message. So we do dearly thank you for that. And as we focus on a, a certain aspect of this message in agriculture, we ask for your special blessing as we go through and help us to understand what agriculture means to you and to what it should mean to us. So bless us to this end and grant us your Holy Spirit for understanding and obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. There can be no obedience without the Holy Spirit. There can be no doing of anything without Christ because Christ said, without me, you cannot do anything. So this move that we're seeking to make, this knowledge that we're seeking to acquire without Christ and His guidance is going to be deadly poison to you and to me and to those you come in contact with. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, so we need to be very aware that without Christ, knowledge is only, can only be used in a negative way. Do you get what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, police officers can use a gun to protect or police officer can go, you know, um, a wall and, and shoot people, okay? But that gun could be used for good or for evil. But it all depends upon where the, who's, who you're serving with that mind, okay? So it's very important for us to understand these things. Without Christ, we cannot do anything. Okay, agriculture. Let's talk about agriculture. The time is fast coming when the controlling power of who? Labor unions. So we talked about that last time, right? Labor unions are going to be the very method that Satan is going to use to bring about the time of trouble, such as never was, okay? The power of labor unions will be very oppressive, okay? Now, you may not realize it, but there's a lot we can do in the 70s that we cannot do these days, okay? Someone could get up and be a plumber and just do plumbing work. But these days, unless you have a certain type of certification or a part of a trade union you cannot do that and I told you about the organic method right organic organically grown I cannot say my produce that I sell is organically grown unless I join the organic trade union which is ran by the US agricultural department okay I call them to find this fact out and you could also find it in their sheet you cannot say even verbally Say, this is an organically grown vegetable or fruit. Do you realize that? You can't use that term. Okay? So you have to say it's naturally grown. <laughs> okay? Or some other thing that could compensate for that. Okay? So it would be very oppressive. It says again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions for in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. So self-support, now we're dealing with self-support at this point, right? Agriculture would give us an opportunity to have food for ourselves, okay? So why do we work? To put a roof over our head? To feed ourselves? Okay? And many times to buy the toys that we like, right? So let's put the toys away. We don't need them, right? So let's talk about food and shelter, okay? What if you lived in a country you got a modest home where you don't have to pay a lot, okay? Very simple. Or nothing at all, by God's grace, okay? So you brought it out right, okay? So you provided your own food. Then what else do you need? Yeah? You need clothes, right? Maybe you can barter away some of your apples, okay? Or maybe sell a little of it and get some money to buy clothes, okay? But we're supposed to have sufficient clothing, right? Not anything excess. Because you can see some... I, wow, <laughs> I'm not blaming anyone. I tell you, I had to cut down a wardrobe. And I had to cut down many times because 
I'm like, I haven't worn this shirt in like a year. That means I have no use for it. You know, when you go into some closets, wow, the amount of stuff that's there, the shoes, wow. You see what I'm saying? So I cut down to like, I think, two or three pair of shoes, you know? I said to myself, I don't need these, all these pair of shoes. So what I'm saying is that when we, be, when we go into modesty of living, everything becomes easier, okay? You don't have to buy so many things and so on or what have you. So you could just barter away a little bit or sell a little bit of your fruits and vegetables or what have you, or even do some practical manual labor, okay? Because at this point in my experience, I work only when I, when I need to work as far as like to, to earn money. The rest of the time, I like doing it, going home to home, doing medical missionary work, okay? And a lot of times, what I do is because, because of, uh, of like with the medical missionary work, it's a benevolent work and I don't charge, I have to earn my living some other ways. I may do mechanic work, I may do carpentry work or whatever work that needs to be done in order to be able to, but I don't have to work that much. I could be home with my family and so on, spend time with them and spend time with God as well, okay? Because we're not supposed to be so busy that we don't have time for ourselves or our children or God, okay? So agriculture will open resources for self-support, okay? And various trades also could be learned. Method and tact are required even to raise fruits and vegetables successfully. We're going to learn some of those tacts, okay? And habits of industry will be found an important aid to the youth in resisting temptation, okay? You let children be idle, wow. It's like they find mischief, okay? So this is a great way to prevent them from, from, from being tempted by the enemy. Study in agriculture line should be the A, B, and C of education given in our schools. Okay, what does that mean? Before you teach a child how to read, okay, or to properly use the English language, what do you do? You teach them A, B, and C. Right? So agriculture is like the very foundation of understanding practical labor. Okay? Practical labor is, 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 is very important. So it's, it should be the A, B, and C of the edu education given in our schools. This is the very first work that should be entered up on. So this is the first thing that you want to do for your children, especially when you're raising them in the country, is to teach them agriculture. That should be the first manual labor that we, we teach to them. Now, are we saying that you don't teach them literally lines? No. Matter of fact, all you smart people that have degrees... We're going to make your brain work today, okay? We have a hole out there, okay? We had to do it, okay? It's a hole like this. It's three feet down, okay? Three feet across, okay? Now, some of you smart people, I want you to start calculating, okay? And tell me how much soil is needed to fill this hole. It's three feet wide and three feet deep. Okay, so I want my smart degreed people to figure out that, okay? Uh, wait until we get to, to, uh, to building, okay? You will realize some of those people, I tell you what, Brother Leo could, could do math in his head like this because he does it every day, measuring and so on, okay? Some of us don't even know how to use the tape measure. Don't even know the measurement things up there, okay? What we mean is that those who have practical education combined with literal education are better fitted to do a work for God than those who have just literary training, okay? And Sister Weiss says, guess what? If one of educational lines has to be neglected, let it be the study of books. If you really cannot provide you have to provide one or the other for your children. The Spirit of Prophecy tells us, teach them manual labor. Okay? If one has to be neglected, she said, let, let it be the study of books. Okay? But, she says, the study of books is also necessary. That's why I recommended those books to you. Me and Brother Lawrence would read those books and we would go do when we have the opportunity to do whatever we're doing and we learn. Just this, this past week, Brother Lawrence helped someone to change uh, a hose line, 
um, because the power steering pump, uh, not the pump, but the power steering line was leaking, okay, for this van, this, this Dodge Caravan, okay. Now, Brother Lawrence never has done that before. What he did, he, re he read the Haynes Manual on how to do that. He went to the brother's house, did what he had to do, changed the thing, earned some finances for himself, and helped the brother also, and he completed. He's never done it before. But what he did, he read, and then he practically used that. Now, who's in a better position at that point? The person that has only literary training, or a person like Brother Lawrence who reads and applies? Do you see what I'm saying? So we're not ignoring education. Education is very important, extremely important, but we want to have a harmonious development of the mental and the physical. Okay? Agriculture. As relaxation from study, occupations pursued in the open air and affording exercise for the whole body are the most beneficial. Okay? No line of manual training is more value than agriculture. See, see what I was telling you earlier? There's nothing that's more value. Great, a great effort should be made to create and to encourage an interest in, agri in agricultural pursuits. Let the teacher call attention to what the Bible says about agriculture. What does the Bible say about agriculture? Let's look at it from Genesis. Adam and Eve were given a, 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 a job. What was it? Till the garden. And then after sin, they were also, they had to do agriculture because they had to raise food to feed themselves. Okay? So the labor of agriculture was given before sin. Okay? So it is, a, it is a work blessed of God prepared for man. Does that make sense? So, by the way, it's never too late to learn agriculture. Okay? Now, where else? Let's keep looking down the line. Okay? You know, Proverbs says, even the king himself is fed by the field. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, as we go down the line, we see, look at what the Savior, how the Savior taught. Look at all the parables that the Savior taught. Most of them have to do with what? Farming methods. Sower seed. The fig tree. Okay? The wheat and the tares. Even the shaking. Even the shaking that, that's told us. You have to understand, if you understand the principles of, of farming methods, understanding the shaking would be very easy for you. There's a difference between separating the wheat from the tares and separating the chaff from the wheat okay there's a big difference and they happen in different times in prophecy okay so what i mean is that when you look through the bible god explains the kingdom of heaven is like a what a mustard seed he the savior couldn't use anything better to explain how heaven's principle works than to use nature. Does that make sense? There's nothing better. Why did the Savior use uh, uh, farming methods and so on? Because the same principles that are in nature is the same principles that governs everything else. Okay? It's the same God that built everything. Many times when you see someone, let's say if you're a teacher, you recognize whose handwriting is what. Oh, this looks like so-and-so's handwriting. Why? Because their character is revealed in their writing. Okay? They always put their eyes, you know. I remember girls used to put a little heart for the eye and so on. And the teacher used to say, I know whose paper this is. Do you see what I'm saying? Because it reveals the character of the individual. Okay? So the character of heaven is revealed in agriculture as well. Okay? So let the teacher call attention to what the Bible says about agriculture, that it was God's plan for man to till the earth, that the first man... The ruler of the world was given garden to cultivate and that many of the world's greatest men, okay, and its real nobility have been tillers of the soil. Can you tell me who some of these men were? Elisha? Who else? Who else was a farmer? Adam. Eve. Okay. Seth. Okay. Noah. Yeah. Enoch. All these people, okay, the world's greatest men, okay, learned, learned uh, uh, the principles of agriculture, okay? Okay. So, uh, show uh, the opportunities in such a life. Uh, the wise man says, the king himself is served from the field, Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 5.9, of him who cultivates the soil 
the Bible declares, His God doth instruct him to discretion and doth teach him. Isaiah 28, 26. Again, whoso keepeth a fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. Proverbs 27, 18. Okay? So the Bible is laden with all these things. Okay? Now, notice this. It says, He who earns his livelihood by agriculture escapes many temptations and enjoys unnumbered privileges and blessings denied to those whose work lies in the great cities. Okay? So that poor farmer has a, man, he has a better time with heaven than us who are in the city. But notice this next one. This one really got me the first time I read it. It says, and in these days of mammoth trust and business competition, what's a mammoth trust? You got it. Okay? Mammoth trust. You do realize there's only one local supplier of electronics left right now and almost in America do you realize that it's only Best Buys when Circus City went down that's it it's only one supplier okay and the small guys cannot compete with that company they cannot offer the same prices as they do no way they can't compete because remember if you buy 30,000 laptops, let's say Best Buy buys 30,000 laptops, okay? Uh, Toshiba laptops, let's say. And you can only afford to have an inventory of like 10. The prices that they get and the prices that you get is completely different. You cannot afford to sell it at the prices that they do, okay? So it says, you know, in, in the days of mammoth trusts, okay? Monopolies and business competition, there are few who enjoy so real and independence Okay, everybody wants to work for themselves, right? And so great a set, a great certainty of fair return for their labor, as does the tiller of the soil. God is saying to us through his prophet, he said, there is no better occupation that you can have that you will have fair return for your labor. So all of us, I, I don't, it doesn't matter how much money you earn, okay? Even if the farmer is earning $30,000 and you're earning $200,000, okay, you will never be repaid the, what you exert for that $200,000, okay? It's probably worth half a million maybe. But the tiller of the soil, guess what? He always gets a fair return for his labor. And he's independent. He's his own boss. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that. He's independent. Let me just say that because he has a boss. It's Christ Jesus. Amen? By the way, man, when you work for Christ, eh, you remember how your boss doesn't know when you sneak and do things? Oh, this boss knows. When you're working for God, you cannot hide anything. You can't cheat on your timesheet and so on and so on, okay? You can't, you can't call out sick when you're really not sick. All those. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? So working for God, but he's merciful, thank the Lord, you know? But... What I'm saying is that you will never earn what you deserve in any occupation, even other manual labor such as mechanics and carpentry. They're better, but not as good as agriculture. Okay? So economically, it's great. In this neighborhood, there's a large tract of unoccupied land. Some of our people who are living in the poison atmosphere of the cities might profitably secure a few acres of this land they could support themselves by raising fruits and vegetables, okay? I wish that some such enterprise as this might be started. A great blessing would come to parents and to children if they would leave the, uh, uh, leave the wicked polluted cities and go into the country, okay? So, I mean, the servant of the Lord said, listen, I wish some enterprise was actually started that can give an opportunity for our brethren and sisters to just get a few acres of land and and support themselves by tilling the soil, okay? So they, you can support yourself by tilling the soil. Fathers should train their sons uh, to engage uh, with them in their trades and employment. Farmers should not think that agriculture is a business that is not elevated enough for their sons, okay? So here's what happened. The people with the factories, the people, you know, such as, let's say, maybe Ford and uh, uh, who wanted to make vehicles and so on and so on they said to themselves listen we need more people okay 
but how do we get because most people in that time were living in rural america they were in the farms how can we lure these young people to come in the cities and become our employees then stay and take up the farm educate them tell them that there's something better than farming and then their fathers once and their mothers once convinced they're going to send their children to the cities okay that was never god's plan that was always satan's plan to have them come into the city and be enticed and so on okay so so they started thinking oh you know farming is not elevated enough i want my kid to go to college and learn things and they got a one-sided education and they they did not do well agriculture sh should be advanced by scientific knowledge okay it's unbelievable some of the scientific knowledge that there is in, in agriculture and I pray that we'll be able to talk about it we'll even talk about the planting method why it's much more advanced than other methods that are out there farming has been pronounced unprofitable interesting people say that the soil does not pay for the labor expended upon it that's not what the last quote told us right but people say that and they bemoan hard fate of those who till the soil but why is it that people say these things but should persons of proper ability take hold of this line of employment and make a study of the soil and learn how to plant to cultivate and to gather in the harvest more encouraging results might be seen so it's like people take on this work and they don't try to learn the best methods how to plant or planting the seeds in proper seasons and so on to get the best yields all these things because this is not done properly, guess what happens? Farming has gotten a bad reputation and name. Many say we have tried agriculture and know its results, uh, what its results are. And yet these very ones need to know how to cultivate the soil and to bring science into their work. Their plowshares should cut deeper, broader furrows, and they need to learn that tilling the soil, they need not become common or coarse in their natures. Okay? The farmer could speak properly, proper English, learn how to do proper mathematics and know how much soil to fill in that hole and all those things, okay? You bring science to, to what you're doing. Let them learn to put in the seed in its season to give attention to vegetation and to follow plant, uh, a plan that God has devised, okay? So that's why agriculture gets a bad name. In cultivation of the soil, thoughtful worker will find treasures little dreamed of are opening before him. No one can succeed in agriculture or gardening without attention to the laws involved. So there are laws in agriculture as well. Okay, maybe we'll learn some of them here. The special needs of every plant must be studied. Okay? The special needs of every plant must be studied. For example, you can use certain amendments, such as what we're going to use today. It's called cottonseed meal. Okay? You take cottonseed and you grind it, you make it into a meal, and you could actually spread some of that in your garden, okay? Now, what plant should you use cottonseed meal for, okay? Cottonseed meal has what we call nitrogen. Nitrogen helps your plant to grow leafy green. You see what I'm saying? And nice and big and so on, okay? But here what now? You don't want to use nitrogen, too much nitrogen, so something like a tomato plant because it's a fruit fruiting tree okay it's a fruit so anything that fruits you don't want to use like peppers you don't want to use too much nitrogen you just want to give it enough but what about your lettuces your kale collards what do you want to do to them you want to give it a little bit more nitrogen than the the uh, uh, you know the tomato or the pepper because this, it's, it, you want it to grow and flourish and big and so on, okay? Does that make sense? So, in, in, in that, you, you want to learn and understand these things, okay? They're not complicated. They're everywhere. It's not a big deal, okay? Now, in the world, they use synthetic nitrogen, okay? We're going to use natural nitrogen. You could use soybean meal, cottonseed meal. You could use leaf compost. And then these things give you great nitrogen, okay? We'll talk about those when we get out there, okay? Uh, <clears throat> different varieties requirement, uh, different soil and cultivation. Compliance with the laws governing each is a condition of success. 
So soil, uh, using certain amendments, and all these things help. The attention required in transplanting, not even a root of fiber shall be crowded or misplaced. The care of young plants, the pruning, watering, the sh uh, uh, shielding from the frost uh, at night and sun by day, keep out weeds, disease, and ins uh, insect pests. And the training and arranging not only teach important lessons concerning the development of character, but the work itself is a means of development. Okay, so when Moses was out there in the wilderness, by taking care of sheep, he, understand, he understood to become a better leader. Okay? You do realize Moses understood the will of God for him in his life. But the methods that he chose to use on his own was to kill an Egyptian. That's his way of deliverance. God said, no son, that's not what I asked for you. So he took him in the wilderness and, I mean, it, it was probably very, I mean, coming from that busy activity life, and taking care of sheep all day, just sitting there watching them, was probably very trying for him. But he learned how to be meek and lowly, and he became the meekest man on, uh, up on the face of the earth. Why? Because when these sheep was going astray, or when danger came, he learned to take care of these sheep. He learned to nurture for them. And if he was faithful with the sheep, how much more? With the, with the human beings that were going to be entrusted into his hand to take them from Egypt to the promised land. You see what I'm saying? That's God's method of education to fill a very responsible position. The best schools of the day, they could not prepare Moses to become a leader of Israel. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why our, the colleges out there, even Seventh-day Adventist colleges that are not run according to the true education principles, cannot give your children the ability to become leaders in this last day's work. They cannot and they will not. Okay? We have to give them an education very different than what the colleges are giving. Okay? <clears throat> Alright. In cultivating uh, carefulness, patience, attention to detail, obedience to law, it imparts a most essential training. Very interesting. Constant contact with mystery of life and the loveliness of nature as well as the tenderness called forth in ministering to these beautiful objects of God's uh, creation tends to quicken the mind and refine and elevate the character. You, you cannot get any better than that. You can't get any better than that. This form of education, everything that you do in agriculture will refine your character. You ever seen someone who may they may not even use cursing language, but they're very coarse in their language. They're very harsh. They can learn to become meek as they're taking care of plants. Do you know that? They're, you, know, they're, they're, you know, they become courteous and so on. God can teach in these things, okay? To live in the country would be very beneficial to them. An active outdoor life would develop health of uh, both mind and body. They should have a garden to cultivate where they might find both amusement, listen to me now, amusement and useful employment. Okay? I don't believe, I'm being sincere with you and I believe these things must be said these days because we're just getting too near the end. You know, uh, taking people, our children to amusement parks, to Chuck E. Cheese's and all these places, they, it does not fit them for heaven. It does not give them characters to love Christ. Matter of fact, it steals affection from Christ. Okay? Most of the time, the very first time children see, you know, that, that, you know, that, that character of Chuck E. Cheese, they get afraid. They're like, what is this thing? They're totally disturbed in their minds, but, but because we continue to push them, they get used to it. Okay? Forgive me, but I never understood roller coasters, for example. Scare yourself to death, alter the circulation of, of, of your, 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 your body. Your blood circulation is totally out of whack when you get off those things. Okay? And then we call that fun. It's, it's, it's very sadistic, brethren. It's very sadistic to scare yourself to enjoyment. Do you get what I'm saying? It's sick. Angels of God are weeping and saying, what is what is the matter with these people? 
But that's how sin, degrading sin is. You would do something that is sin, that is hateful to God, that will make the angels weep, that will make Jesus who died for you weep, and you will smile and enjoy it. That's how degrading sin is. Okay? So amusement should be this thing. Now, when your children have employment and they're actually working this well, they will enjoy it. They will. It may take time if the children have learned the other way. It may take time to develop their characters to love agriculture. But believe you me, they will learn. Okay? But here what? It's not just employment and amusement to do agriculture. But in doing that, they're actually producing something. They're actually doing something good for themselves and for those that they love. They're producing something. Do you see what I'm saying? Food is produced to actually help someone. So it's two birds with one stone, and maybe three or ten, ten birds with one stone in using God's method. The training of plants and flowers tends to improve. What is that? Do your children have taste? And I'm not talking about just, you know, coordinating colors of what they wear in clothing. I'm talking about taste. And so, sometimes you're like, there's no way I'm going to let you wear that clothing. Okay? Oh, there's no way I'm going to let you do that. Okay? Taste. And what? What's that word there? Be honest with yourself, parents. How much good judgment do your children have? I know in growing up, my dad just... Uh, when I was in high school, I got in five accidents, I think, in a, a matter of one year. Just bad judgment. Okay? Bad judgment. And, and, and my dad had to pay for that. So when we don't train our children, they'll give us sorrow when they grow up and pain. So what I'm saying is that if you want taste and judgment to be in the characters of your children, this is the best thing we can do for them. While an acquaintance with God's useful and beautiful creation has a refining and ennobling influence upon the mind, referring it to the maker and master of all, which is God. So doing agriculture actually connects us with God. Okay? And that constant contact with Christ tends to change us. Because the Bible says, by beholding, we become what? Amen. Okay? Brother Lawrence, you still have the audio connected to this? I'm going to show you a, a video of a family, okay, that actually lives in the city. Okay? They actually live in the city, but guess what? What they do is that they grow all their food in a, I think it's, Point five, it's either half an acre or a third of an acre, which is a half or a third of an acre. They, they grow all their food by just agriculture, okay? That's how they survive. They live in California, one of the most high, you know, prized neighborhoods, okay? Now, this family understands that issue of they, they can have free independence if they raise their own food, okay? So whatever they raise, they eat, and whatever they have extra of, they sell to these lavish restaurants who want local fresh stuff because they know that the taste is different. So it's a family of four that literally supports themselves with $30,000. They're happy, and they have the time in the world for everything. Okay? But don't take this too far because this family doesn't understand that soon... When food is scarce, people are going to come and loot their home. Because everybody knows in the neighborhood that they grow their own food. But when you're out in rural districts, guess what happens? You'll be free from the interference of enemies. Okay? Do the best that you can and God will take care of the rest. Right? So let's, let's just watch this video and see what God has in store for us. Tonight on that door. The real simple life. Could you grow everything you need to eat in your yard? This family does it on just a tenth of an acre in the suburbs. Are they the most frugal family in America? From the Global Resources of ABC News. Can everybody hear that? And Cynthia McFadden in New York City. This is Nightline, May 15, 2008. Good evening, everyone. I'm Terry Moran. Tonight... Eating local, really local. 
Flying food that's grown nearby has a profound impact on the environment, yielded an entire movement they call themselves locavores. But if you take it to an extreme, growing everything you need on your own property can also be easy on the pocketbook. And if you don't do well on a map, it's possible in the suburbs.
certain point, this car, these crops, their persistence, it made the family, rather than odd, into an interesting part of the community. Neighbors began dropping by to purchase eggs and vegetables. School children visit on field trips. They even have an internet business now selling earth-friendly farm tools. This family of four lives on $30,000 a year. Do you feel that you're in poverty? I just don't feel poor. And I feel blessed, I feel rich. Late one afternoon, son Justin gassed up the car with his homebrew fuel, and the Gervais family set out to visit the local restaurants that they supply with fresh vegetables, such as Helen's, a new place in town with a superb chef named O'Neill Chibas, who loves that stuff and names one of his salads after the family. This is actually your salad, your name in the menu. But the thing that strikes me is that you are the last guy in the world who would pay $13 for a salad. Well, Am I right about that? Well, because, because um, you're frugal. Well, it's true. Jewel's lifestyle at this point depends on there being enough people who will pay 13 bucks for a salad. Otherwise, he doesn't have that market. He also depends on nature being nice to him. He needs rain. You're much more tied in to whether it rains or not than you are to what's happening with the interest rates. Yes. Then there are the social consequences of their profound frugality. It saves a lot of money because um, he doesn't have a family. You wonder how or where these young adults who are here with each other all day, every day, ever get to meet other people. You see yourselves getting your sisters and brother getting out and getting married and starting families oh, and moving away. Yeah, we're looking for farming. All right. <laughs> so, I just show you a, a very practical example of a family that's totally living on what they raise, on $30,000 in the city. How much more in the country? Do you see what I'm saying? It will give you a real independence that you've been seeking for. You will get to spend time with your children and with your spouse and have that relationship and time with Christ. So it's, it's it, you see, knowing and understanding practical things will lead us to be independent of man and more dependent on God. So you see what he said? He said, you're more interested whether it rains or not than the interest rate. See, when you need it to rain, you don't call up your bank. You call up on the Lord. It's better to depend and be at the mercy of the Lord than man, right? But if you need money, you have to, you know, of course you pray to God. God will help you to get it too. But what I'm saying is that it, it's you go direct to the throne of God and say, Lord, I need rain. And it gets us into that communion with God that, that, that He wants us to have, okay? So I... I'm just telling you that the, God has put this example before us so that we can get a glimpse of what could be done. But with us, with us it's even better than what the DeRays are doing. Okay? Because we, we are living for God and for these last days and we're living to educate those that need help. Okay? So, by the way, did you see what they did with that car, biodiesel? I thought about teaching you guys how to make those things. I know how to do it. Okay? Yes. It's not that complicated. It's very, very easy. Okay? Biodiesel is a very easy product to make. It's not that complicated. You can buy the test kits and everything. And if you have a diesel car, you can make it. I'm, I don't think we'll have time to show it to you in the mechanic class. If we do, we will. I'll make it in a small batch and show it to you. Okay? Um, if not, I can give you directions on how to make it. Okay, so at least you'll have that. So these are all things that God has given us to be able to make sure we support ourselves. Okay? All right? So by the way, the first, I'm told anyway, it could be false or true, but the guy that made the diesel engine, okay, his, his last name was Diesel, <laughs> and the guy that made the diesel engine, that they say that his, his mindset in constructing the diesel engine was that it would work on peanut oil, okay? You do realize that a, a diesel engine can actually work totally on pure oil without any, anything added to it, but then you could also refine it to become what we call biodiesel. But that, I'm, I'm told by some, some say it's true, some say it's false, but his, what his intention was. And so his intention was that there were these big engines that farmers can use 
you know, and they and farmers can raise their own peanuts, get their own oil out of them, and then be able to use and be efficient. Okay, it, and uh, tropical environments are very, especially easier to use biodiesels than even in America, because when it gets cold, it can go funny on you. But anyway, I'll, we'll talk about that if we have time in the mechanics class. Okay, so everybody understand the importance of agriculture, what it means to heaven. Okay, and I'm praying that it will mean that much to us. So what we're gonna do? We're gonna leave this room, and you're gonna head. Does everyone know where the parking lot is? Okay. You just take a right, and you're gonna see the parking lot. We're gonna go in the parking lot. Everything should be there. We're gonna do soil mixing, and we're gonna construct the raised bed gardens like you saw the DeVries have. Okay. Now you see that on the raised bed gardens, they were able to on a on a half of an acre. We're able to raise. Okay, one, I'm sorry, one-fifth of an acre. Able to raise all that they need for a family of four. Okay? So, we'll go show you that method right now. So, just exit outside, and we're going to go into the parking lot, okay? Yes, baby. Oh, by the way, make sure you get this sheet, please. For those of you who came in did not get one, make sure you get this sheet. We also have CDs for you back there. Uh, country living on audio, okay? All right. Great. Yes. Brother Mavua. How are you doing, sister? Amen.